Our scripture reading this morning is from Colossians 3.14. Beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bound of unity. Let's stand together and pray. Lord Almighty, this morning we bow down our hearts and our knees before your Almighty, before your throne. God, thank you for another week where we, led by the Holy Spirit, were able to put into practice what we learned last Sunday. Thank you so much for this morning where we, where we gather together again to listen and to learn from you and your words from the Holy Scripture what we have to do, how ad our attitudes have to be. Lord, and we, this morning we join together with the thousands and thousands of the crowds in heaven giving praise and worship to you, singing worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Lord, and this morning our hearts go out to, especially to those who are in great suffering, who are in tremendous loss by having relatives in the hospital or even losing their kids, their parents, due to the circumstances. I, we pray that you may grant comfort to them and that, that we, you give all the strength they need right now. And we pray also for wisdom for Pastor Ricky who will preach this morning and who will instruct us in the wisdom of your scripture. Please open our hearts and that we receive and put into practice what we have to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm not going to grab that. But uh, you can stay standing for a moment. I just want to welcome us here this morning. Uh, if you're visiting here with us uh, at Lane Prairie Baptist Church, we're excited that you've come to worship the Lord with us here today. Uh, if you would not mind, in the row in front of you, in the back of the chair, there is a card that looks similar to this one right here. It has a church logo on it. If you would not mind filling that out and then... Uh, dropping it even in one of the offering boxes across the back, or you can give it to one of our staff after the service. But uh, that gives us a record of your attendance here with us today. But as we prepare to worship, I, I want to celebrate and praise the Lord for what He's done this week. Uh, and I think it'll kind of help set the tone for us as we begin to worship. You know, each week uh, we have, as we've started four weeks ago, our uh, church-wide uh, emphasis for Hoosier One to be intentional in praying for the lost, to be intentional in being obedient to the Great Commission, to proclaim, uh, to give a verbal witness of who Jesus is, what he's done, and uh, what he's done through his life, his death, his resurrection, and how that can uh, grant eternal life and forgiveness for sinners. And so each week we gather and we have these ping pong balls here. Maybe you're visiting and you saw them and thought that looks weird up there on the Lord's Supper table. But a white ball represents someone committing to pray for somebody. An orange ball uh, indicates the fact that somebody this week was intentional in presenting a, a verbal uh, witness of who Jesus was and calling someone to repentance. And a green ball represents someone who's professed faith this week. And so as you can see this week, uh, there are 19 orange balls in there, so there were 19 gospel conversations that were had by our members this week, but there are 30 green balls, so 30 people who made professions of faith this week. And so I, I want you to know uh, Brother Terry and David Ernest went to the prison uh, on Thursday. Uh, they preached two different services, saw 28 men make professions of faith. As we're here, this ought to set the tone for our worship that we celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God doing what only He can do in saving yes. men, but we have a responsibility to go forth and proclaim the good news. And so as we worship today, you're already standing. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Doughton, but uh, we're glad you're here. Let's worship. Let us worship the Lord. He is holy and worthy to be praised. We stand and lift up our hands. 
For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Yes, He's holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. As we stand and lift up our hands, we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone, everyone. died for my transgressions that he paid that price a long long time ago when he gave his life for me on a hill called Calvary but there's something else that I want to know does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Can he hear the crowd cry, crucify again? Am I causing him pain? Then I know I've got to change. I just can't bear the thought. I'm so good at breaking promises, and I 
treat his precious grace so carelessly. But each time he forgives, what if he relives the agony he felt on that dream? Does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Can he hear the crowd cry, crucified? again am i causing him pain then i know i've got to change I just can't bear the thought of hurting him Thank you, Matthew. If you have a copy of the Word of God today, I'd ask you to open to the book of Colossians chapter 3. It's where we're going to be today as we continue our walk uh, through this series, uh, through the book of Colossians, Christ overall. Um, We're just going to be looking at three verses this morning. Um, My goal is to have you out of here in time to um, make it to Chick-fil-A for lunch today before there's a line. So, see if you can be the first one there. In case you don't eat at Chick-fil-A, they're not open on Sunday. (laughs) Well, let me uh, give us a little context before we get to our text today to remind us where we've been. Uh, We had a break last week uh, for our Roundup Sunday with Dr. Carl Bradford. Did a great job preaching the Word of God, challenging us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, uh, but as we get back into this, I want to remind us where we've been, uh, not all the way back through the book, but at least to the beginning of uh, chapter 3. As we remember, as we started into chapter 3, it became with this uh, just uh, kind of a 30,000 foot exhortation where we're told to seek and set our minds on the things above, all right, not the earthly things. And so, hey, in this process, when you're in Christ, what it means, how are we sanctified? It's, it's through this process where we need to to fix our attention on the things that are above, not on the things that are below. And then in the next verses that we went through and then what we'll go through today, it gets to the very practical way in which we do that. And so uh, as we looked previously in verses 5 through 11, we looked at two different lists of vices of the things that he said we needed to put to death and then the things that needed to be 
cast off. And then he made a transition there um, where he, he reminded us that uh, in verse 10 that, that we are a, this is a new self. There was the old self, those things, those vices that needed to be put to death. They were a part of that old self, but we are a new one re, being renewed, as it says there at the end, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And that is Jesus. And so he's done away with the negative. He said, here's the things that need to be cast off, put to death, done away with. But just like you and I, when we go and we get dirty and we get grimy, we, we take off that old, that dirty, we put something back on. And so that's where we're at today in verses 12, 13, 14, is we're going to be looking at, um, for us, what does it look like? We know what it shouldn't look like. Now, what does it look like for us to be in Christ as we go through our life? And so I want to read this text for us today. I'd ask if you're uh, able and willing to stand for uh, the reading of God's Word. I'm going to be reading verses, as I said, 12, 13, and 14 from the New American Standard. And it says this, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Father, today may you bless the reading of your word. Father, I pray that your spirit, uh, Father, that we would allow the spirit to do work in our lives to show us things that need to be put to death, things that need to be cast off, and virtues that need to be put on uh, so that we are day by day being renewed to the true knowledge of the image of the one who created us, Jesus Christ. We pray this now in his mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. And so uh, I, I want us to walk through uh, these verses today, and I want us to look at this. We, we've got this, that, hey, here, here's this list of virtues that were now to be put on. And so I, I want us to look through, and I'm going to give you these uh, three points up front, and then we're going to walk through and talk from this. And so there's the reason why we should put these on, and then there's the requirement, all right, and then there's the result that comes out of it. So... Tried to be a good preacher this week and alliterate everything. Uh, had to get busy there looking up uh, synonyms and all kinds of stuff to find something that worked. Uh, that's some of the toughest stuff about putting this stuff together. Uh, but uh, y'all don't care about that. But uh, <laughs> I try to do it at times so it sticks with you. So we've got the reason, the requirement, and the result. So if you don't know that next week, you didn't pass the test and you can't have one of Miss Debbie's suckers out of the jar in here uh, when you come in. But if you do, you can. But I want us to look. And so it's interesting, the Apostle Paul here, and I think he does this under the inspiration. I know he does this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I believe he starts this way for a reason. And, and he starts with the reason why before he says and says, this is what you should do. And you, you think about it, those of us that are parents, we do the same thing at times, right? When we want... Uh, to uh, direct our child to be compliant with something we're going to ask them to do. A lot of times we'll st start with, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, I'll be like, hey, you know how I show you that I love you because you have a roof over your head and you got to eat today and you got clothes to wear. And Remember we took you to that place that you wanted to go. And so we start that way a lot of times before we say, hey, now I need you to go clean your room or go clean the bathroom or empty the dishwasher or go mow the yard. Do y'all do that as parents, right? We begin to lay out these reasons. Why do we do that up front? Because usually what happens if we're reminded of the reason before the command comes, there's usually a better rate of compliance. And that's how it usually works in my household, right? If I just say, hey, go do this, I don't want to do that. But Jacob would never do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But usually if we start the other way and say, hey, here's this and this and this. Here's the reasons why I'm asking you to do this. Here, here, here's what I've done. Here, here's this, so here's this. So let's start in the first part of verse 12 with the reason uh, before we get to the command that he gives them. He says this. He says, so as those who are chosen of God, holy and beloved, and there is the reason. He is reminding them of who they are in Christ Jesus. Before he gives the command, before he says, here's the requirement of, of what's expected of you to be in Christ, he reminds them that they are that they are chosen, that they are in 
Christ. And, and you know what's interesting about this is, um, remember, this is being written to the Colossian church, but also it, it was there for the Laodicean and the, the church there at Hierapolis. Um, but these were Gentile congregations predominantly. But as they read this letter, the interesting thing is, is this, that they probably heard and caught on, is they heard some of the terms that were used exclusively for Israel for so long. And to hear the Apostle Paul say, hey, you are a part of this. You're not separate. And so he says, hey, you are chosen. And, and so you and I, we need to understand if we're in Christ that we are chosen, right? We are in Christ. We are chosen because God uh, Jesus is God's chosen one. We see this in scripture. We see it in Luke 23, 35, where Jesus is there being crucified and they're mocking him, but they declare the truth, the fact that he is God's chosen one. We see in Isaiah 42, 1, where it talks about the fact that uh, the Messiah is what? The God's chosen one. And we look and he says, hey, not only are you chosen, but you're holy, set apart, special, we see this in Acts 4.27, there when uh, James and John are, are, are uh, arrested and they're told, hey, you can't go about preaching anymore in the name of Jesus, you can't do that anymore. It says they release, they go back to their companions and they begin to celebrate and they talk about Jesus as being the holy servant Jesus. They say it twice, verse 27 and then again in verse 30. And so these, these, he says, hey, it's holy, but then also beloved. You know, these things were talked about Israel, but these are all things that we see in Scripture. They talked about who Jesus is, and then we are in Christ. These things apply to us as well. Beloved, we see it in Mark chapter 1, verse 11. This is at Jesus' baptism where he goes down, and he comes up, and then there was that voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son. But for us, as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossians, as the Word of God is here for us and speaking us today, we're reminded that the reason that we should go on to the requirement and be obedient to it is the fact that we are chosen, we are in Christ, we're holy, we're beloved. Hey, son, daughter, I love you and I show my love for you in this way, and so now here's why I'm calling you to obedience in this thing. God is saying, hey, you are chosen, you are in Christ, you are set apart, you are beloved. And so here's why I'm calling you to be obedient to this command, to this requirement. So we see the reason. Some of us here today just need to know, and we need to hear that. You need to hear the fact that you are beloved. Because some of us probably walk through our life, and some of us maybe just fell completely flat on our face. We lost it with our spouse. We lost it with our child. We lost it at work with that person. I thought, man, I don't feel very loved today. I don't feel like I'm anyone's beloved. But what the Word of God says, if you are in Christ, you are beloved. You are holy. You say, well, I didn't act very holy. Well, praise be to God, Jesus has covered that. And uh, we stand, even though practically we might not be, but positionally we stand in Christ before a holy God, holy as well through Jesus Christ. And the fact that God has brought me in through Jesus to be part of his chosen people. That's enough reason for whatever comes next for us just to say, before we even see it, to say, yes, I'll do it. Right? And I, I think that's why the Apostle Paul starts here. He reminds them of who they are in Christ. And when we have that proper perspective, obedience usually comes a whole lot easier. And so we see the reason we're chosen, holy, beloved. But let's look... Also at the requirement, he says, all right, well, what is it? What's the command? What am, what am I supposed to do? He says, then put on. There's the command right there. Put on or, or literally clothe yourself. He's picking up and continuing the analogy he used uh, previously. If you flip back, you can see it there um, in verse 10. and says, having put on the new self. Same word is used there. Hey, we're clothed. He says, but hey, we're being, you need to put on. And then he's going to go into the same way before we had those lists, uh, the list of five of the vices that we were to put to death and we were to cast off. He's going to give us a list of 
of five and says, here's what you need to put on. Here's what you need to clothe yourself. Here's the character qualities that should be evident of your life as you walk through this life in Christ Jesus. And so let's look through them uh, today as you hear this list. It'll probably somewhat sound similar to uh, what you hear uh, in the fruit of the Spirit from the book of Galatians. Uh, It's not all of it, but it sounds very similar. But it says this, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. That's the first thing right there. Literally, uh, it's really literally the word bowels. All right. So guys, if you want to be super romantic from now on, you just tell your wife like, hey, I, I, my bowels, I just love you so much from my bowels. Right. Sounds romantic, doesn't it? I've never seen that Valentine's Day card at Target. So, uh, but uh, I might send them the idea. But, but in this time, that, that, that was the seat, that's what they viewed as the seat of emotion, all right? And you, so you would think that, like, you've had a stomach ache or something, like, you, like, you feel that, right? And so that, that, that's why that word, but it's the idea of heart, of compassion. And so literally, it, it's this idea of mercy that leads to action, right? It's not just, compassion is not just a feeling, but it's, it's us acting. It's the feeling that then leads to action. So we're to put on, we're to clothe ourselves with a heart of compassion for those that are around us. We seek mercy and action. We, we go on behalf, and right? We feel compassion for people, so we intercede on their behalf, Right? And so um, we see that. He goes on in the list just so we can get through this in our text today. He says, what do we put on after compassion? He says, put on kindness. Or some of your translations might say goodness. And I, I, I like the, what one uh, person defined this is, is, is this, is gracious sensitivity towards others triggered by genuine care. That's what kindness is. Gracious sensitivity Towards others triggered by genuine care. Kindness. So put on a heart of compassion. Put on kindness. What else do we put on? Humility. And so this is something that in the midst of Greek philosophy and everything would fly in the face of them. They would view humility as weakness. That this is inferior, right? They, they, this is something that, remember uh, when we talked uh, last time, we talked about these lists, and they were very similar to uh, a lot of the Stoic philosophers. They would have these lists, and they sound similar. Humility would not be listed on those lists, all right? But uh, this is this idea that this humbleness, this humility before God and others, right? I, I think it's not an either or. I think it's a both and. Right? We should not think too highly of ourselves. The Apostle Paul has already dealt with that back in chapter 2, verse 18. Flip back there if you want to. You can see it. But this is what he said. Remember, he's talking about those that were seeking to oppress and the legalism in which they were bringing. He was describing them. He goes, let, let no one keep defrauding you for the prize uh, of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, uh, taking his stand on visioning scenes and inflated without cause in his fleshly mind. There was no humility. Humility there. It was the exact opposite. It says, for you and I, we're to clothe ourselves with humility. All right? And, and this is genuine humility, not false humility. All right? You know, we know, we know the old, uh, what's the old country song? Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're what? Perfect in every way. False humility. None of us suffer with that, right? Not even me. I would join uh, the Apostle Paul on that and say I'm the chief center of that right there. Humility. But this humbleness, this, this need not to be for it to be about you because it's not. So humbleness, humility before God and others. He goes on in the list and he says, what else do we need to put on but gentleness, courtesy. And the idea here is, and you know, we probably all probably, we hear that word gentleness and we think about it in the church context, you probably come to mind like a picture or a painting you've seen of Jesus sitting there painting, uh, petting a little lamb, right? Well, that's what we get. But that's not really the intent of this word here. The, The intent here is this, is the willingness to make allowance 
for others, for their shortcomings. This doesn't mean that we compromise truth. That's not what we're talking about, or else there's no point for the Apostle Paul to be writing this letter to the church at Colossae. But a willingness to make allowances for their shortcomings, that means when someone falls flat on their face, we don't go stand over them, Lord, out over them, and tell them how terrible they are. And I can't believe you did that. You're a despicable person. No, gentleness makes an allowance, and it really ought to bring us to a point where we help pick them back up. And he goes on from there, and he says, and then the fifth one in the list is this, patience. And again, we hear patience and we get the idea like, uh, like, I just have to wait, right? We think of automatically, we think just waiting is patience. But the, the real intent here is in this is the idea of not reacting for revenge, it's that continued idea from gentleness above of making allowance for shortcomings of, of that. It's, it's, it goes right along with the line. It says, hey, bearing with. And so as we hear these things, heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, right? If we look at the world, it, it, it is polar opposites, right? Right? As we look through the second list of vices that we looked through previously, it is opposite. Anger, malice, wrath, slander, abusive language. None of those things make allowance. None of those things uh, are mercy or gracious. So the requirement is that we clothe ourselves in these things. We'll never clothe ourselves in these things if we're not daily walking with the Lord. Right? That's why so many of these you see come up in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit only comes by walking with the Lord day by day. We at times can give the appearance of these things, but they eventually show themselves to be disingenuous if it's not real. So the command, the requirement, put on. But there's actually one more thing that we're told to put on as well. But uh, I brought something here. I'm glad Cooper left because he'd probably run up here and try and take this away from me. Um, anybody? Sarah, you're close. You can see. Do you, what do I have here? Can you? Do what? Legos, right? How many folks, kids, grandkids, Legos, if you're an adult, you still play with Legos? Raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But Legos, can you tell me what this is? Besides Legos, generally it's Legos, but what was the purpose of these Legos? What were they? Anybody? Derek? Huh? A toy? Yeah. A boat? Looks like a boat, right? This actually at one point in time was an X-Wing fighter from Star Wars. There's the four wings. And so, you know, I love to do Legos. Cooper loves Legos. He, in fact, has a basket in his room that's just full of Legos. But if you've put Legos together like I have, you know that it is a tedious process, Right? And so we'll usually start, it'll go really good, and then Cooper disappears, but I'm not going to give up, I'm going to finish, I'm going to persevere, I'm going to do this, it's going to look exactly like it does in the picture. I get it done, Cooper's excited because it's done, he finally comes back two minutes later. And then I'm not patient anymore. I'm not willing to make uh, allowance <laughs> for his shortcomings and destroying my hard work. We had one one time we did. It was a double-decker bus, and it took hours. And it was sitting on the dresser in his room, and he went to reach for something, and I heard it in the living room. It, pieces everywhere. 
And I was so upset. All my hard work. And so after that happened, Candace and I were talking about it, and I said, man, somebody needs to invent something that we can put on this so it just stays together. And so she, like, did what everybody does nowadays. She got her phone out and went to Google. And so, like, they literally now make glue spray for Legos. You take, you build it, you take, and you spray it over. It seals it. It holds it all together. And I'm like, please order us a 55-gallon drum. I'm not just going to spray it. I'm going to dip it, coat it. I'm going to put it in a glass box. But look at what the Apostle Paul goes on here and tells us. He tells us one more thing to put on. In verse 14, he says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And so the idea that the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, here's what you need to do. You need to put on the heart of compassion, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness. But over top of those things, beyond those things, we put on love. And that's what holds it all together. That's what perfects it. That's the glue that's going to hold the Legos together. Because we can have false humility, we can have false compassion, false kindness, false gentleness, false patience. But when we put on love, love is what brings the truth to it. It's what perfects it. And you know, that's the goal of what the Apostle Paul was doing, right? His goal in what he was doing was what? To present them complete. What? How do I know that? Well, I can flip back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, and listen to what he says. We proclaim him, talking about Jesus, admonishing every man. We're teaching, uh, we're encouraging them, every man, with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And so how, how, how practically do we do this? We, we try and be more humble. We try and be more kind and patient. But we do that as we walk with the Lord. But over that, we have to put on love. Like, I genuinely am kind and compassionate because I genuinely love this person. Why do I love them? Because God first loved me. And I've experienced his love through what Jesus has done through the cross of Calvary. And therefore my response. And Jesus, I mean, if you want to know what the sum of, of the command of God is, Jesus told us. Right? He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What? It was first to what? Love God with everything that you are. And the second is like it that you should what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is what binds it all together. So the requirement is to put on these things. This is the, the character qualities, the virtues that we should strive to be exemplified in our life. But they're bound on us by love. They're exercised because we love this person. Even though they might be very different from us and they might have a different opinion from us. But I love them because they're created in the image of God. And God loved them enough that he died on the cross for them the same as he died on the cross for me. All those things, he says, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. What will draw us together. So we see the reason, we see the requirement, and then finally I want us to see the result. Look at it, it's back up to verse 13. He says this, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. All right? So the result is this, the tangible, visible result of us clothing ourselves with a heart of compassion, with kindness, with gentleness, with humility, with patience, and binding those over with love is the tangible, visible act of us bearing with one another in everyday life and forgiving each other when we mess up. That is how it is fleshed out. That is what it looks like inside the church. What's interesting in this text is it moves from the individual, but it moves to the corporate. It's like this is what it is for you, but then it shows up and it works itself out in the body of Christ. Bearing with, enduring, right? And then also forgiving one another. And what's interesting here is that word that the Apostle Paul uses in forgiving is not the typical word that would be used. It's just something that Paul uh, typically used in place of it, but it comes from the root word where it 
of grace. It's this idea of being gracious towards one another. As we have received God's grace, we then reciprocate that grace to one another day by day as we live in fellowship with one another. All right? And so, you know, the church is made up of different people. No two of us have grown up exactly alike, all right? No two of us are the same, all right? I, I, I have three older sisters and a younger brother. Every single one of us are different. We were raised in the same house by the same parents, same ideals, but we're different people. And the church is no different. We see this spelled out in the text, backing up in our previous. He talks about, hey, there was Greek and there was Jew in the congregation. There's, there were those that were uh, slaves and those that were free. There was all these different classes that man has established amongst people. And, and they come from different walks of life. They come from different economic backgrounds, different social backgrounds. All of these things. And so there's bound to be times where we just butt heads. But the Apostle Paul says what it means to be sanctified, what it means to be in Christ and be conformed to the image of Christ is as we do that, we do it and we bear with one another. We give allowance. We do it with gentleness. We do it with patience. We're humble and don't think, I, I, I'm from this place and so that makes me better than this person. The Apostle Paul would have said here for the Colossian church, if you're a slave or you're a free man, you're no better than the other. If you're a Jew or a Greek, you're no better than the other. You're either in Christ or in need of being in Christ. But the result, and it's visible, do we practice this? Do we bear with one another? What's interesting about this text, look at it as it goes on. He says, we're bearing with, we're forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave, so also. Here's the interesting thing. When we're offended, we love the feeling we get of being entitled because we've been wronged, right? And so what we do oftentimes is we've been wronged is we stand here on our soapbox a lot of times and we like to cast at that person and say, you did this, you did this wrong, you offended me, now you have to come to here to where I'm at. And that's not at all what this text says. The, the initiation of restoration is, against, is for the one who was offended to go and make it right. For us to exercise, to make the allowance. And you see, that's not just spelled out here. This is spelled out in Matthew chapter 18. If anybody sinned against you, you go to them. This is the same thing that God's done for us. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't stand there and say, you're a dirty, rotten sinner, so you get back to here, and then I'll deal with you. He said, while you're still out there, while you've offended me, while you've sinned against me, as all the things that we saw previously in the text that he talked about them, the fact that uh, we are formerly alienated, this is chapter 1, verse 21, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, what? Christ died. And so, putting on and being clothed in a heart of compassion says, I've been offended, but I'm going to go seek to restore. I'm going to not stand here and get to cast judgment, but I'm going to go out of love, which is binding this all together, to see a brother or a sister restored, to be made right. Right? A church. There's over 200 people here today. Guess what? If we were to have a poll about what we should do for some particular thing in the church, we'd probably have, uh, you know, we always like to go over it. But, you know, in realistic, if there's 200 people here, we could easily have 100 different opinions about what we should do. Some people would agree. Some people wouldn't. And a lot of times as we get so caught up in that that we don't bear with, we don't endure, we don't forgive one another. I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for how we do business because the reality of this is we're seeking to do the will of God, right? And the reality is we make decisions as a church. We, we pray about what is the will of God, but the reality is is not every single one of us is going to be able to decipher the will of God at that exact moment in time because sometimes we're dealing with stuff. Sometimes we're not sensitive to the Spirit because we've got unconfessed sin, but we have our opinion about this and that. 
And so the idea here is that in the church is that God's brought together a group of believers and that we endure and we might be here, but God through us collectively was going to do his will. He's going to accomplish it. I know that. And we talked about it a few weeks back. You know, you might not like the, the shade of the light bulbs, uh, right? I, well, I don't like it. That's too white of a light in there. It's not warm enough. That's great, whatever. But as we go through life, every single one of us from a different point, different background, different cultures, they don't do things here the same way they do them in Nigeria. They don't do the same things here the way they do them in Germany, uh, in uh, Algeria. They don't do the same things in East Texas the way we do them here, right? Brazil, I mean, they don't even like peanut butter over there. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. But we're going to come in from different places and different things. And we have to be able to go forward together as a group of believers. And if we're not putting on these things and putting love over them, it will never happen. You'll find a church that's bitter. You'll find a church that's backbiting. You'll find a church that's always divided, that's probably not accomplishing the Great Commission because they're more focused on all these other things. Bearing with one another. So we see the reason. We see the requirement. And we see the result. So that's great. What do we do with this? Uh, what's the application? What do we take away with this? And well, the first thing I'd say this is that the, very in the immediate, the application to this is actually seen in the result, right? If we truly take this and we put it into practice, what happens? We bear with one another and we're forgiving of one another. We walk along, we're different from one another, but yet we find a way to keep going in God's direction. All right? And so are we bearing with one another? Are we forgiving no church is perfect because not one of us is perfect. The second thing that I'd say to us today is this idea, and this is the problem with that happens at a lot of places, is this, is we tend to equate unity and uniformity. Uniformity is not unity, right? Uniformity means and usually what happens when people equate unity and uniformity is this, is that in the church context, when, hey, I, I don't necessarily agree with this, not, not, we're not talking about anything that's outside of Scripture, that's being uh, disobedient to Scripture, that's sinful. I'm just talking about what we do day to day. And we look and say, well, I don't usually do this. Uniformity says, well, if you don't like it, then go. We only want people here that are just like us, that think just like us, that want to do exactly what we want to do in the way that we want to do it. That's not a healthy place to be. Unity says, well, I might think this way and like practically we could accomplish this this way. Well, practically, yeah, we could accomplish this this way. But what is God's will? And we pray about it. We seek. I, I love the way our church does business because we come. We pray about it. You've been asked to pray about things. We come. We vote. Some people will vote yes. Some people will vote no. But uh, we're trusting that there are enough people seeking the will of God that we will decipher the will of God and continue to do the will of God. And unity comes at that point where it says, maybe I said no, but this is what the church has affirmed by yes and so, okay, I'm, I'm in this with you. Whereas uniformity would go, well, you voted against this, or you don't like this, and you've done this, and so you should leave. You should go find someone else that's like you. You should go find a church that thinks exactly this way. Because in methods, there's a lot of different ways that we can accomplish doing what God wants us to do here. 
But I believe he guides us in certain areas and certain paths and programs that we do. And, and we pray about those things as a staff and what we do and how we do them. And yeah, we could do it this way. We could do it that way. We could do all that. But our concern is, is what is God's will? And so for us, if we're going to put these things on, we're going to get to this point where we'll bear with. Well, I'd have done it that way, but that's okay. We're still accomplishing this. And so I'm not just going to set myself to the side because I didn't get my way. And I'll just sit over here and grumble because you'll end up like that list of vices where you'll be angry. You'll sit there and simmer malice, wrath, and then all of a sudden slander and abusive language. And then you're lying about people. But we put on love over it. And we're united together. Right? What are we doing here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church? Real simple. We're trying to love God with all that we are and love every single person that we come across the way that we want to be loved and we're loved by God. How we go about doing that, how we go about sharing that truth, program-wise, method-wise, it, it might vary a little bit, but that's what we're here and that's what we're doing. Can you get behind that? If you can't, then it's not me, it's the word of God we got to go back and try and reconcile with. So, application is seen in the result. Are we bearing with one another? Are we forgiving one another? Understanding this idea that uniformity isn't automatically unity. Um, and then finally, it, it's also kind of where we ended that last time. It's the, the sense that we need to step back and take inventory. Do we see these things evident in our life? A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, binded over with love. And then finally today, maybe you're here, maybe you're here apart from Christ. This is a message and this word is for those who are in Christ to put these things on. But what happens a lot of times when we are around church and we begin to come to church and we don't have a relationship with God yet, we get falling into this trap and I say, well, then a Christian looks like this and so I need to start acting like this. And that's not at all what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He's not saying here, this is not a call to be morally better so that God will accept you. This is a response of those who are already in Christ. The reality for those who aren't in Christ, he says this, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, there, I am the only way to be forgiven, to have eternal life, to, to, to have redemption, to have, as we see in the book of Colossians, our certificate of debt canceled out. It's through Jesus only. It's not by being a good person. It's not by good works. And what times we, we come to passages like that and maybe God's working on us. He, he's working to draw us. He, he's doing a work, the spirit in our lives. And then we kind of hear something like this and we're like, well, I'll, I'll just be better and God will be happy. No. He's holy. Better is not good enough. Perfect is good enough. And when you attain to that, you come and let me know how you did it. I'd like to know. The only way that I stand perfect positionally today is through Jesus Christ. Is that when God looks at me, he sees me through Jesus Christ. Because there came a point in my life where I believed what I saw in the word of God about who Jesus was. About how he lived his life, how he died and how he was raised again. I believe that to be true by faith. I turned from my sin and I confessed Jesus as Lord. And on that day I was saved. Because I did all the other good stuff for 17 years of my life, and it didn't get me there. And so if you're here today, I want you to know, I want you to hear me close. This is not a call for you if you do not have a personal relationship with God to just be morally better so that God will be pleased with you. It will never happen. He is simply calling you to himself. He said, I've paid the price. Here's what I'm calling you to do, to believe it to be true who I am, what I've done, turn from your sin and confess me as Lord. And so today as we come to this point, our invitation as Dalton and the others come, we respond to the word of God. 
is this, is, is this time of response is for several things. It's for the one who's here today who does not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that today that you might come and say, hey, I, I'm not there, I want to be, I, I need to be forgiven. I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. You come down, that's all you have to tell us. We'd love to sit down and talk to you more about how you can know that you have forgiveness. Know that you have eternal life. But I believe probably the bulk of it today is for those of us that are here in Christ to look at our lives and say, have I been diligent each and every day to get up and put on, to clothe myself in these things and then to bind them over with love? Am I striving to bear with another? Am I striving to seek forgiveness and restoration? Or am I striving to get my way at whatever it costs? Maybe you're here today. Maybe God's been calling you. You've been visiting. He said, hey, this is the church where I'm calling you to plant your life, to plant your family, to serve and be served by the body. You could come this morning and join with us. How you join our church, you simply walk the aisle, come and talk to one of our pastors and say, hey, this is where God wants us to be, and we'll talk with you about that. But our prayer is just that you would be obedient to what God is calling you to do. For the sinner, it's to salvation. For the believer who is not exemplifying these uh, virtues that we should, it's repentance. So you stand as I pray, and then we'll have our song of invitation. Father, today I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's quick and powerful, that it does work in our lives. It brings conviction. It brings encouragement to let us know that we are chosen and holy and beloved of you when we're in Christ Jesus. That that's who we are. That's our identity in Christ. Father, if we have not bound over these virtues with love, Father, don't allow us to continue to go on being hypocrites in false kindness and false compassion. We're really good at playing the part sometimes. So, Father, please just do work in our lives. May we respond in obedience to your spirit. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated briefly this morning. I want to present a few people to you this morning. Uh, While they're finishing up, I'll start over here with uh, Sarah Wester. Sarah, yeah, you can come up here. Uh, This is Sarah Wester. She's going to be a, she's in our intern program. She's a student up at Southwestern. And so she's coming today. She is from uh, Indiana. And so she's coming today. She's here just as a student out of state. And so not coming just to join the church, but just saying at, as her time while she's here in this area going to school, that she's kind of placing herself under us, kind of a, that we're going to watch over her uh, while she's here. And so we wanted her to come forward so you could see her, so you should know. I know she Wednesday night was in with the students, I believe, uh, and doing some different things. And so, uh, but we want you to know who she is. We're excited to have her with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, and then Myra, you come up here. This is Myra Shipsky. Um, she comes today to join with us uh, here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church, coming by statement. She was sharing with me that she was actually baptized 1973 here at Lane Prairie, but it was before they ever had a baptistry here. Um, and so... Uh, and so she's coming today. She does not have letter at another church, but she's coming by statement today that she knows the Lord Jesus Christ. She's been baptized. She was baptized here uh, back then. But coming back, uh, be with us, her sister, several weeks back, uh, or probably a month or more now, yeah. Linda Fort, came and joined with us as well. I think started coming back at our 150th anniversary service and just keeps on coming back. And so uh, she believes it's where God wants her to be and to serve. And so I'm thankful for our lady Sunday school class that's reached out to her and others as well. So if you accept her coming by statement today, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.